Chapter 7 of Moral Letters, Volume 1, by Seneca, translated by Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 7. On Crowds Do you ask me what you should regard as especially to be avoided? I say, crowds. For as yet you cannot trust yourself to them with safety. I shall admit my own weakness at any rate, for I never bring back home the same character that I took abroad with me. Something of that which I have forced to be calm within me is disturbed. Some of the foes that I have routed return again. Just as the sick man, who has been weak for a long time, is in such a condition that he cannot be taken out of the house without suffering a relapse, so we ourselves are affected when our souls are recovering from a lingering disease. To consort with the crowd is harmful. There is no person who does not make some vice attractive to us, or stamp it upon us, or taint us unconsciously therewith. Certainly, the greater the mob with which we mingle, the greater the danger. But nothing is so damaging to good character as the habit of lounging at the games. For then it is that vice steals subtly upon one through the avenue of pleasure. What do you think I mean? I mean that I come home more greedy, more ambitious, more voluptuous, and even more cruel and inhuman because I have been among human beings. By chance, I attended a midday exhibition, expecting some fun, wit, and relaxation, an exhibition at which men's eyes have respite from the slaughter of their fellow men. But it was quite the reverse. The previous combats were the essence of compassion. But now, all the trifling is put aside and it is pure murder. Footnote. During the luncheon interval, condemned criminals were often driven into the arena and compelled to fight for the amusement of those spectators who remained throughout the day. And footnote. The men have no defensive armor. They are exposed to blows at all points, and no one ever strikes in vain. Many persons prefer this program to the usual pairs and to the bouts by request. Of course they do. There is no helmet or shield to deflect the weapon. What is the need of defensive armor or of skill? All these mean delaying death. In the morning they throw men to the lions and the bears. At noon they throw them to the spectators. The spectators demand that the slayer shall face the man who is to slay him in his turn, and they always reserve the latest conqueror for another butchering. The outcome of every fight is death, and the means are fire and sword. This sort of thing goes on while the arena is empty. You may retort, but he was a highway robber. He killed a man. And what of it? Granted that, as a murderer, he deserved this punishment. What crime have you committed, poor fellow, that you should deserve to sit and see this show? In the morning they cried, Kill him, lash him, brand him. Why does he meet the sword in so cowardly a way? Why does he strike so feebly? Why doesn't he die game? Whip him to meet his wounds. Let him receive blow for blow, with chests bare and exposed to the stroke. And when the games stop for the intermission, they announce, A little throat cutting in the meantime, so that there may still be something going on. Come now, do you... Footnote. The remark is addressed to the brutalized spectators. And footnote. Do you not understand even this truth? that a bad example reacts on the agent? Thank the immortal gods that you are teaching cruelty to a person who cannot learn to be cruel. The young character, 
which cannot hold fast to righteousness, must be rescued from the mob. It is too easy to side with the majority. Even Socrates, Cato, and Lelius might have been shaken in their moral strength by a crowd that was unlike them. So true it is that none of us, no matter how much he cultivates his abilities, can withstand the shock of faults that approach, as it were, with so great a retinue. Much harm is done by a single case of indulgence or greed. The familiar friend, if he be luxurious, weakens and softens us imperceptibly. The neighbor, if he be rich, rouses our covetousness. The companion, if he be slanderous, rubs off some of his rust upon us, even though we be spotless and sincere. What then do you think the effect will be on character when the world at large assaults it? You must either imitate or loathe the world. But both courses are to be avoided. You should not copy the bad simply because they are many, nor should you hate the many because they are unlike you. Withdraw into yourself as far as you can. Associate with those who will make a better man of you. Welcome those whom you yourself can improve the process is mutual, for men learn while they teach. There is no reason why pride in advertising your abilities should lure you into publicity, so that you should desire to recite or harangue before the general public. Of course I should be willing for you to do so, if you had a stock in trade that suited such a mob. As it is, there is not a man of them who can understand you. One or two individuals will, perhaps, come in your way. But even these will have to be molded and trained by you so that they will understand you. You may say, For what purpose did I learn all these things? But you need not fear that you have wasted your efforts. It was for yourself that you learned them. In order, however, that I may not today have learned exclusively for myself, I shall share with you three excellent sayings of the same general purport which have come to my attention. This letter will give you one of them as payment of my debt. The other two you may accept as a contribution in advance. Democritus says, One man means as much to me as a multitude and a multitude only as much as one man. The following also was nobly spoken by someone or other, for it is doubtful who the author was. They asked him what was the object of all this study applied to an art that would reach but very few. He replied, I am content with few, content with one, content with none at all. The third saying, and a noteworthy one too, is by Epicurus, written to one of the partners of his studies. Quote, I write this not for the many, but for you. Each of us is enough of an audience for the other. End quote. Lay these words to heart, Lucilius, that you may scorn the pleasure which comes from the applause of the majority. Many men praise you. But have you any reason for being pleased with yourself, if you are a person whom the many can understand? Your good qualities should face inwards. Farewell. End of chapter 7 Chapter 41 of Moral Letters, Volume 1, by Seneca, translated by Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 41. On the God Within Us You are doing an excellent thing, one which will be wholesome for you, if, as you write me, you are persisting in your effort to attain sound understanding. 
It is foolish to pray for this when you can acquire it from yourself. We do not need to uplift our hands towards heaven, or to beg the keeper of a temple to let us approach his idol's ear, as if in this way our prayers were more likely to be heard. God is near you. He is with you. He is within you. This is what I mean, Lucilius. A Holy Spirit indwells within us, one who marks our good and bad deeds, and is our guardian. As we treat this Spirit, so are we treated by it. Indeed, no man can be good without the help of God. Can one rise superior to fortune unless God helps him to rise? He it is that gives noble and upright counsel. In each good man, quote, a God doth dwell, but what God we know not. Footnote. Virgil, Aeneid, Book 8, Line 352. End footnote. If ever you have come upon a grove that is full of ancient trees which have grown to an unusual height, shutting out a view of the sky by a veil of pleached and intertwining branches, then the loftiness of the forest, the seclusion of the spot, and your marvel at the thick unbroken shade in the midst of the open spaces, will prove to you the presence of deity. Or if a cave, made by the deep crumbling of the rocks, holds up a mountain on its arch, a place not built with hands but hollowed out into such spaciousness by natural causes, your soul will be deeply moved by a certain intimation of the existence of God. We worship the sources of mighty rivers. We erect altars at places where great streams burst suddenly from hidden sources. We adore springs of hot water as divine, and consecrate certain pools because of their dark waters or their immeasurable depth. If you see a man who is unterrified in the midst of dangers, untouched by desires, happy in adversity, peaceful amid the storm, who looks down upon men from a higher plane and views the gods on a footing of equality, will not a feeling of reverence for him steal over you? Will you not say, this quality is too great and too lofty to be regarded as resembling this petty body in which it dwells. A divine power has descended upon that man. When a soul rises superior to other souls, when it is under control, when it passes through every experience as if it were of small account, when it smiles at our fears and at our prayers, it is stirred by a force from heaven. A thing like this cannot stand upright unless it be propped by the divine. Therefore, a greater part of it abides in that place from whence it came down to earth. Just as the rays of the sun do indeed touch the earth, but still abide at the source from which they are sent, even so the great and hallowed soul which has come down in order that we may have a nearer knowledge of divinity, does indeed associate with us, but still cleaves to its origin. On that source it depends, thither it turns its gaze and it strives to go, and it concerns itself with our doings only as a being superior to ourselves. What, then, is such a soul? One which is resplendent with no external good, but only with its own. For what is more foolish than to praise in a man the qualities which come from without? And what is more insane than to marvel at characteristics which may at the next instant be passed on to someone else? A golden bit does not make a better horse. The lion with gilded mane, in process of being trained and forced by weariness to endure the decoration, is sent into the arena in quite a different way from the wild lion, whose spirit is unbroken. The latter, indeed, bold in his attack, as nature wished him to be, impressive because of his wild appearance, and it is his glory that none can look upon him without fear, is favored 
in preference to the other lion, that languid and gilded brute. Footnote. The spectators of the fight, which is to take place between the two lions, applaud the wild lion and bet on him. End footnote. No man ought to glory except in that which is his own. We praise a vine if it makes the shoots teem with increase, if by its weight it bends to the ground with the very poles which hold its fruit. Would any man prefer to this vine, one from which golden grapes and golden leaves hang down? In a vine the virtue peculiarly its own is fertility. In a man also we should praise that which is his own. Suppose that he has a retinue of comely slaves and a beautiful house, that his farm is large and large his income. None of these things is in the man himself. They are all on the outside. Praise the quality in him which cannot be given or snatched away, that which is the peculiar property of the man. Do you ask what this is? It is soul, and reason brought to perfection in the soul. For man is a reasoning animal. Therefore, man's highest good is attained if he has fulfilled the good for which nature designed him at birth. And what is it which this reason demands of him? The easiest thing in the world, to live in accordance with his own nature. But this is turned into a hard task by the general madness of mankind. We push one another into vice. And how can a man be recalled to salvation when he has none to restrain him and all mankind to urge him on? Farewell. End of chapter 41 Chapter 42 of Moral Letters, Volume 1, by Seneca, translated by Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 42. On Values Has that friend of yours already made you believe that he is a good man? And yet it is impossible in so short a time for one either to become good or to be known as such. Do you know what kind of man I now mean when I speak of a good man? I mean one of the second grade, like your friend. For one of the first class perhaps springs into existence, like the phoenix, only once in five hundred years. And it is not surprising, either, that greatness develops only at long intervals. Fortune often brings into being commonplace powers, which are born to please the mob. But she holds up for our approval that which is extraordinary by the very fact that she makes it rare. This man, however, of whom you spoke, is still far from the state which he professes to have reached, and if he knew what it meant to be a good man, he would not yet believe himself such. Perhaps he would even despair of his ability to become good. But, you say, he thinks ill of evil men. Well, so do evil men themselves and there is no worse penalty for vice than the fact that it is dissatisfied with itself and all its fellows. But he hates those who make an ungoverned use of great power suddenly acquired. I retort that he will do the same thing as soon as he acquires the same powers. In the case of many men, their vices, being powerless, escape notice although as soon as the persons in question have become satisfied with their own strength, the vices will be no less daring than those which prosperity has already disclosed. These men simply lack the means whereby they may unfold their wickedness. Similarly, one can handle even a poisonous snake while it is stiff with cold. The poison is not lacking. It is merely numbed into inaction. In the case of many men, their cruelty, ambition, and indulgence only lack the favor of fortune to make them dare crimes that would match the worst. That their wishes are the same, you will in a moment discover in this way. Give them the power equal to their wishes. 
Do you remember how, when you declared that a certain person was under your influence, I pronounced him fickle and a bird of passage, and said that you held him not by the foot, but merely by a wing? Was I mistaken? You grasped him only by a feather. He left it in your hands and escaped. You know what an exhibition he afterwards made of himself before you. How many of the things he attempted were to recoil upon his own head. He did not see that in endangering others he was tottering to his own downfall. He did not reflect how burdensome were the objects which he was bent upon attaining, even if they were not superfluous. Therefore, with regard to the objects which we pursue, and for which we strive with great effort, we should note this truth. Either there is nothing desirable in them, or the undesirable is preponderant. Some objects are superfluous, others are not worth the price we pay for them. But we do not see this clearly, and we regard things as free gifts when they really cost us very dear. Our stupidity may be clearly proved by the fact that we hold that buying refers only to the objects for which we pay cash, and we regard as free gifts the things for which we spend our very selves. These we should refuse to buy if we were compelled to give in payment for them our houses or some attractive and profitable estate. But we are eager to attain them at the cost of anxiety, of danger, and of lost honor, personal freedom, and time. So true it is that each man regards nothing as cheaper than himself. Let us therefore act in all our plans and conduct just as we are accustomed to act whenever we approach a huckster who has certain wares for sale. Let us see how much we must pay for that which we crave. Very often the things that cost nothing cost us the most heavily. I can show you many objects, the quest and acquisition of which have wrested freedom from our hands. We should belong to ourselves if only these things did not belong to us. I would therefore have you reflect thus, not only when it is a question of gain, but also when it is a question of loss. This object is bound to perish. Yes, it was a mere extra. You will live without it just as easily as you have lived before. If you have possessed it for a long time, you lose it after you have had your fill of it. If you have not possessed it long, then you lose it before you have become wedded to it. You will have less money. Yes, and less trouble. Less influence. Yes, and less envy. Look about you and note the things that drive us mad, which we lose with a flood of tears. You will perceive that it is not the loss that troubles us with reference to these things, but a notion of loss. No one feels that they have been lost, but his mind tells him that it has been so. He that owns himself has lost nothing. But how few men are blessed with ownership of self. Farewell. End of chapter 42 Chapter 50 of Moral Letters, Volume 1, by Seneca Translated by Gummier This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 50. On Our Blindness and Its Cure I received your letter many months after you had posted it. Accordingly, I thought it useless to ask the carrier what you were busied with. He must have a particularly good memory if he can remember that. But I hope by this time you are living in such a way that I can be sure what it is you are busied with, no matter where you may be. For what else are you busied with except improving yourself every day, laying aside some error, and coming to understand that the faults which you attribute to circumstances are in yourself. We are indeed apt to ascribe certain faults to the place or to the time, but those faults will follow us no matter how we change our place. You know Harpaste, 
my wife's female clown. She has remained in my house, a burden incurred from a legacy. I particularly disapprove of these freaks. Whenever I wish to enjoy the quips of a clown, I am not compelled to hunt far. I can laugh at myself. Now this clown suddenly became blind. The story sounds incredible, but I assure you that it is true. She does not know that she is blind. She keeps asking her attendant to change her quarters. She says that her apartments are too dark. You can see clearly that that which makes us smile, in the case of Harpaste, happens to all the rest of us. Nobody understands that he is himself greedy, or that he is covetous, yet the blind ask for a guide, while we wander without one, saying, I am not self-seeking, but one cannot live at Rome in any other way. I am not extravagant, but a mere living in the city demands a great outlay. It is not my fault that I have a choleric disposition, or that I have not settled down to any definite scheme of life. It is due to my youth. Why do we deceive ourselves? The evil that afflicts us is not external. It is within us, situated in our very vitals. For that reason we attain soundness with all the more difficulty, because we do not know that we are diseased. Suppose that we have begun the cure. When shall we throw off all these diseases, with all their virulence? At present we do not even consult the physician, whose work will be easier if he were called in when the complaint was in its early stages. The tender and the inexperienced minds would follow his advice if he pointed out the right way. No man finds it difficult to return to nature, except the man who has deserted nature. We blush to receive instruction in sound sense. But, by heaven, if we think it base to seek a teacher of this art, we should also abandon any hope that so great a good could be instilled into us by mere chance. No, we must work. To tell the truth, even the work is not great, if only, as I said, we begin to mold and reconstruct our souls before they are hardened by sin. But I do not despair even of a hardened sinner. There is nothing that will not surrender to persistent treatment, to concentrated and careful attention. However much the timber may be bent, you can make it straight again. Heat unbends curved beams, and wood that grew naturally in another shape is fashioned artificially according to our needs. How much more easily does the soul permit itself to be shaped, pliable as it is, and more yielding than any liquid? For what else is the soul than air in a certain state? And you can see that air is more adaptable than any other matter, in proportion as it is rarer than any other. There is nothing, Lucilius, to hinder you from entertaining good hopes about us, just because we are even now in the grip of evil, or because we have long been possessed thereby. There is no man to whom a good mind comes before an evil one. It is the evil mind that gets first hold on all of us. Learning virtue means unlearning vice. We should therefore proceed to the task of freeing ourselves from faults with all the more courage because, when once committed to us, the good is an everlasting possession. Virtue is not unlearned. For opposites find difficulty in clinging where they do not belong. Therefore, they can be driven out and hustled away. But qualities that come to a place which is rightfully theirs abide faithfully. Virtue is according to nature. Vice is opposed to it and hostile. But although virtues, when admitted, cannot depart and are easy to guard, yet the first steps in the approach to them are toilsome, because it is characteristic of a weak and diseased mind to fear that which is unfamiliar. The mind must, therefore, 
be forced to make a beginning. From then on, the medicine is not bitter, for just as soon as it is curing us, it begins to give pleasure. One enjoys other cures only after health is restored, but a drought of philosophy is at the same moment wholesome and pleasant. Farewell. End of chapter 50. Chapter 58 of Moral Letters, Volume 1 by Seneca, translated by Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 58 on Being. How scant of words our language is, nay, how poverty stricken, I have not fully understood until today. We happen to be speaking of Plato, and a thousand subjects came up for discussion, which needed names, and yet possessed none. And there were certain others which once possessed, but have since lost, their words, because we were too nice about their use. But who can endure to be nice in the midst of poverty? There is an insect, called by the Greeks oistrus, footnote, the gadfly, which drives cattle wild, and scatters them all over their pasturing grounds. It used to be called asilus in our language, as you may believe on the authority of Virgil. Near Silurus's groves, and eke Albernus's shades, of green-clad oak trees flits an insect named asilus by the Romans. In the Greek, the word is rendered oistrus. With a rough and strident sound it buzzes and drives wild, the terror-stricken herds throughout the woods. Footnote. Georgics, Book 3, Line 146, Folio. By which I infer that the word has gone out of use. And, not to keep you waiting too long, there were certain plain words current, like ternere ferro inter se, as will be proved again by Virgil. Great heroes, born in various lands, had come to settle matters mutually with the sword. Footnote, Aeneid, Book 12, Line 708, Folio. This settling matters we now express by decernere. The uncompounded word has become obsolete. The ancients used to say yusso instead of yusero in conditional clauses. You need not take my word, but you may turn again to Virgil. The other soldiers shall conduct the fight with me where I shall bid. Footnote. Aeneid, Book 11, Line 467. It is not my purpose to show, by this array of examples, how much time I have wasted on the study of language. I merely wish you to understand how many words that were current in the works of Aeneas and Accius have become moldy with age, while even in the case of Virgil, whose works are explored daily, some of his words have been filched away from us. You will say, I suppose, what is the purpose and meaning of this preamble? I shall not keep you in the dark. I desire, if possible, to say the word essentia to you, and obtain a favorable hearing. If I cannot do this, I shall risk it, even though it put you out of humor. I have Cicero as authority for the use of this word, and I regard him as a powerful authority. If you desire testimony of a later date, I shall cite Fabianus, careful of speech, cultivated, and so polished in style that he will suit even our nice tastes. For what can we do, my dear Lucilius? How otherwise can we find a word for that which the Greeks call usia, something that is in the natural substratum of everything? I beg you, accordingly, to allow me to use this word, essentia. I shall nevertheless take pains to exercise the privilege, which you have granted me, with as sparing a hand as possible. Perhaps I shall be content with the mere right. Yet what good will your indulgence do me, if, lo and behold, I can in no wise express in Latin the meaning of the word which gave me the opportunity to rail at the poverty of our language? And you will condemn our narrow Roman limits even more when you find out that there is a word of one syllable which I cannot translate. What is this? you ask. It is the word 
on. You think me lacking in facility. You believe that the word is ready to hand, that it might be translated by quod est. I notice, however, a great difference. You are forcing me to render a noun by a verb, but if I must do so, I shall render it by quod est. There are six ways in which Plato expresses this idea, according to a friend of ours, a man of great learning, who mentioned the fact today. And I shall explain all of them to you if I may first point out that there is something called genus and something called species. For the present, however, we are seeking the primary idea of genus, on which the others, the different species, depend, which is the source of all classification, the term under which universal ideas are embraced. And the idea of genus will be reached if we begin to reckon back from particulars. For in this way, we shall be conducted back to the primary notion. Now, man is a species as Aristotle says, so is horse or dog. We must therefore discover some common bond for all these terms, one which embraces them and holds them subordinate to itself. And what is this? It is animal. And so there begins to be a genus, animal, including all these terms, man, horse, and dog. But there are certain things which have life, anima, and yet are not animals, for it is agreed that plants and trees possess life, and that is why we speak of them as living and dying. Therefore, the term living things will occupy a still higher place, because both animals and plants are included in this category. Certain objects, however, lack life, such as rocks. There will therefore be another term to take precedence over living things, and that is substance. I shall classify substance by saying that all substances are either animate or inanimate, but there is still something superior to substance, for we speak of certain things as possessing substance and certain things as lacking substance. What then will be the term from which these things are derived? It is that to which we lately gave an inappropriate name, that which exists. For by using this term, they will be divided into species, so that we can say, that which exists either possesses or lacks substance. This, therefore, is what genus is, the primary, original, and, to play upon the word, general. Of course, there are other genera, but they are special genera, man, being, for example, a genus. For man comprises species, by nations, Greek, Roman, Parthian, by colors, white, black, yellow. The term comprises individuals also, Cato, Cicero, Lucretius. So man falls into the category genus, insofar as it includes many kinds. But insofar as it is subordinate to another term, it falls into the category species. But the genus that which exists is general and has no term superior to it. It is the first term in the classification of things, and all things are included under it. The Stoics would set ahead of this still another genus, even more primary, concerning which I shall immediately speak, after proving that the genus which has been discussed above has rightly been placed first, being, as it is, capable of including everything. I therefore distribute that which exists into these two species, things with and things without substance. There is no third class. And how do I distribute substance? By saying that it is either animate or inanimate. And how do I distribute the animate? By saying certain things have mind while others have only life. Or the idea may be expressed as follows. Certain things have the power of movement, of progress, of change of position, while others are rooted in the ground. They are fed and they grow only through their roots. Again, into what species do I divide animals? They are either perishable or imperishable. Certain of the Stoics regarded the primary genus, footnote, 
i.e. the genus beyond that which exists, as the something, I shall add the reasons they gave for their belief. They say, quote, in the order of nature some things exist, and other things do not exist, and even the things that do not exist are really part of the order of nature. What these are will readily occur to the mind, for example, centaurs, giants, and all other figments of unsound reasoning, which have begun to have a definite shape, although they have no bodily consistency." End quote. But I now return to the subject which I promised to discuss for you, namely, how it is that Plato divides all existing things in six different ways. The first class of that which exists cannot be grasped by the sight or by the touch or by any of the senses, but it can be grasped by the thought. Any generic conception, such as the generic idea man, does not come within the range of the eyes, but man in particular does, as for example Cicero, Cato. The term animal is not seen, it is grasped by thought alone. A particular animal, however, is seen, for example a horse, a dog. The second class of things which exist, according to Plato, is that which is prominent and stands out above everything else. This, he says, exists in a preeminent degree. The word poet is used indiscriminately, for this term is applied to all writers of verse, but among the Greeks it has come to be the distinguishing mark of a single individual. You know that Homer is meant when you hear men say, the poet. What then is this preeminent being? God, surely, one who is greater and more powerful than anyone else. The third class is made up of those things which exist in the proper sense of the term. They are countless in number, but are situated beyond our sight. What are these? you ask. They are Plato's own furniture, so to speak. He calls them ideas, and from them all visible things are created, and according to their pattern all things are fashioned. They are immortal, unchangeable, inviolable. And this idea, or rather Plato's conception of it, is as follows. The idea is the everlasting pattern of those things which are created by nature. I shall explain this definition in order to set the subject before you in a clearer light. Suppose that I wish to make a likeness of you. I possess in your own person the pattern of this picture, wherefrom my mind receives a certain outline, which it is to embody in its own handiwork. That outward appearance, then, which gives me instruction and guidance, this pattern for me to imitate, is the idea. Such patterns, therefore, nature possesses in infinite number, of men, fish, trees, according to whose model everything that nature has to create is worked out. In the fourth place we shall put form. And if you would know what form means, you must pay close attention, calling Plato, and not me, to account for the difficulty of the subject. However, we cannot make fine distinctions without encountering difficulties. A moment ago I made use of the artist as an illustration. When the artist desired to reproduce Virgil in colors, he would gaze upon Virgil himself. The idea was Virgil's outward appearance, and this was the pattern of the intended work. That which the artist draws from this idea and has embodied in his own work, is the form. Do you ask me where this difference lies? The former is the pattern, while the latter is the shape taken from the pattern and embodied in the work. Our artist follows the one, but the other he creates. A statue has a certain external appearance. This external appearance of the statue is the form and the pattern itself has a certain external appearance, by gazing upon which the sculpture has fashioned his statue. This is the idea. 
If you desire a further distinction, I will say that the form is in the artist's work, the idea outside his work, and not only outside it, but prior to it. The fifth class is made up of the things which exist in the usual sense of the term. These things are the first that have to do with us. Here we have all such things as men, cattle, and things. In the sixth class goes all that which has a fictitious existence, like void or time. Whatever is concrete to the sight or touch, Plato does not include among the things which he believes to be existent in the strict sense of the term. For they are in a state of flux, constantly diminishing or increasing. None of us is the same man in old age that he was in youth nor the same on the morrow as on the day preceding. Our bodies are hurried along like flowing waters. Every visible object accompanies time in its flight. Of the things which we see, nothing is fixed. Even I myself, as I comment on this change, am changed myself. This is just what Heraclitus says. We go down twice into the same river, and yet into a different river. For the stream still keeps the same name, but the water has already flowed past. Of course, this is much more evident in rivers than in human beings. Still, we mortals are also carried past in no less speedy a course. And this prompts me to marvel at our madness in cleaving with great affection to such a fleeting thing as the body and in fearing lest some day we may die, when every instant means the death of our previous condition. Footnote. This idea Seneca has already developed in Epistle 24, Section 20. Will you not stop fearing lest that may happen once, which really happens every day? So much for man, a substance that flows away and falls, exposed to every influence. But the universe, too, immortal and enduring as it is, changes and never remains the same. For though it has within itself all that it has had, it has it in a different way from that in which it has had it. It keeps changing its arrangement. Very well, say you. What good shall I get from all this fine reasoning? None, if you wish me to answer your question. Nevertheless, just as an engraver rests his eyes when they have long been under a strain and are weary, and calls them from their work, and feasts them, as the saying is, so we, at times, should slacken our minds and refresh them with some sort of entertainment. But let even your entertainment be work, and even from these various forms of entertainment you will select, if you have been watchful, something that may prove wholesome. That is my habit, Lucilius. I try to extract and render useful some element from every field of thought, no matter how far removed it may be from philosophy. Now what could be less likely to reform character than the subjects which we have been discussing? And how can I be made a better man by the ideas of Plato? What can I draw from them that will put a check on my appetites? Perhaps the very thought that all these things which minister to our senses, which arouse and excite us, are by Plato denied a place among the things that really exist. Such things are therefore imaginary, and though they, for the moment, present a certain external appearance, yet they are in no case permanent or substantial. Nonetheless, we crave them, as if they were always to exist, or as if we were always to possess them. We are weak, watery beings, standing in the midst of unrealities. Therefore, let us turn our minds to the things that are everlasting. Let us look up to the ideal outlines of all things that flit about on high, 
and to the god who moves among them and plans how he may defend from death that which he could not make imperishable because its substance forbade and so by reason may overcome the defects of the body for all things abide not because they are everlasting but because they are protected by the care of him who governs all things but that which was imperishable would need no guardian the master builder keeps them safe overcoming the weakness of their fabric by his own power let us despise everything that is so little an object of value that it makes us doubt whether it exists at all let us at the same time reflect seeing that providence rescues from its perils the world itself which is no less mortal than we ourselves that to some extent our petty bodies can be made to tarry longer upon earth by our own providence if only we acquire the ability to control and check those pleasures whereby the greater portion of mankind perishes plato himself by taking pains advanced to old age to be sure he was the fortunate possessor of a strong and sound body his very name was given to him because of his broad chest but his strength was much impaired by sea voyages and desperate adventures nevertheless by frugal living by setting a limit upon all that rouses the appetites and by painstaking attention to himself he reached that advanced age in spite of many hindrances you know i am sure that plato had the good fortune thanks to his careful living to die on his birthday after exactly completing his eighty-first year for this reason wise men of the east who happened to be in athens at the time sacrificed to him after his death believing that his length of days was too full for a mortal man since he had rounded out the perfect number of nine times nine i do not doubt that he would have been quite willing to forego a few days from this total as well as the sacrifice frugal living can bring one to old age and to my mind old age is not to be refused any more than it is to be craved there is a pleasure in being in one's own company as long as possible when a man has made himself worth enjoying the question therefore on which we have to record our judgment is whether one should shrink from extreme old age and should hasten the end artificially instead of waiting for it to come a man who sluggishly awaits his fate is almost a coward just as he is immoderately given to wine who drains the jar dry and sucks up even the dregs but we shall ask this question also is the extremity of life the dregs or is it the clearest and purest part of all provided only that the mind is unimpaired and the senses still sound give their support to the spirit and the body is not worn out and dead before its time for it makes a great deal of difference whether a man is lengthening his life or his death but if the body is useless for service why should one not free the struggling soul perhaps one ought to do this a little before the debt is due lest when it falls due he may be unable to perform the act and since the danger of living in wretchedness is greater than the danger of dying soon he is a fool who refuses to stake a little time and win a hazard of great gain few have lasted through extreme old age to death without impairment and many have lain inert making no use of themselves how much more cruel then do you suppose it really is to have lost a portion of your life than to have lost your right to end that life do not hear me with reluctance as if my statement applied directly to you but weigh what i have to say it is this that i shall not abandon old age if old age preserves me intact for myself and intact as regards the better part of myself but if old age begins to shatter my mind 
and to pull its various faculties to pieces, if it leaves me not life, but only the breath of life, I shall rush out of a house that is crumbling and tottering. I shall not avoid illness by seeking death, as long as the illness is curable and does not impede my soul. I shall not lay violent hands upon myself just because I am in pain, for death under such circumstances is defeat. But if I find out that the pain must always be endured, I shall depart, not because of the pain, but because it will be a hindrance to me as regards all my reasons for living. He who dies just because he is in pain is a weakling, a coward. But he who lives merely to brave out this pain is a fool. But I am running on too long. And besides, there is matter here to fill a day. And how can a man end his life if he cannot end a letter? So farewell. This last word, footnote, since wale means keep well, no less than goodbye, you will read with greater pleasure than all my deadly talk about death. Farewell. End of chapter 58 Chapter 65 of Moral Letters, Volume 1 by Seneca Translated by Gummier This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 65. On the First Cause I shared my time yesterday with ill health. Footnote, for Seneca's troubles in this regard, see also Epistles 54 and 104. It claimed for itself all the period before noon. In the afternoon, however, it yielded to me. And so I first tested my spirit by reading. Then, when reading was found to be possible, I dared to make more demands upon the spirit, or perhaps I should say to make more concessions to it. I wrote a little, and indeed with more concentration than usual, for I am struggling with a difficult subject and do not wish to be downed. In the midst of this, some friends visited me, with the purpose of employing force and of restraining me, as if I were a sick man indulging in some excess. So conversation was substituted for writing, and from this conversation I shall communicate to you the topic which is still the subject of debate, for we have appointed you referee. You have more of a task on your hands than you suppose, for the argument is threefold. Our Stoic philosophers, as you know, declare that there are two things in the universe which are the source of everything, namely cause and matter. Matter lies sluggish, a substance ready for any use, but sure to remain unemployed if no one sets it in motion. Cause, however, by which we mean reason, molds matter and turns it in whatever direction it will, producing thereby various concrete results. Accordingly, there must be, in the case of each thing, that from which it is made, and next, an agent by which it is made. The former is its material, the latter its cause. All art is but imitation of nature. Therefore, let me apply these statements of general principles to the things which have to be made by man. A statue, for example, has afforded matter which was to undergo treatment at the hands of the artist, and has had an artist who was to give form to the matter. Hence, in the case of the statue, the material was bronze, the cause was the workman, and so it goes with all things. They consist of that which is made and of the maker. The Stoics believe in one cause only, the maker, but Aristotle thinks that the word cause can be used in three ways. The first cause, he says, is the actual matter, without which nothing can be created. The second is the workman. The third is the form, which is impressed upon every work, a statue, for example. This last is what Aristotle calls the idos. There is two, says he, a fourth, the purpose of the work as a whole. Now I shall show you what this last means. Bronze is the first cause of the statue, for it could never have been made unless there had been something from which it could be cast and molded. 
The second cause is the artist, for without the skilled hands of a workman, that bronze could not have been shaped to the outlines of the statue. The third cause is the form, inasmuch as our statue could never be called the lance-bearer, or the boy binding his hair, footnote, well-known works of Polyclitus, 5th century BC, had not this special shape been stamped on it. The fourth cause is the purpose of the work, for if this purpose had not existed, the statue would not have been made. Now what is this purpose? It is that which attracted the artist, which he followed when he made the statue. It may have been money, if he has made it for sale, or renown, if he has worked for reputation, or religion, if he has wrought it as a gift for a temple. Therefore, this also is a cause contributing towards the making of the statue. Or do you think that we should avoid including, among the causes of a thing which has been made, that element without which the thing in question would not have been made? To these four, Plato adds a fifth cause, the pattern which he himself calls the idea, for it is this that the artist gazed upon when he created the work which he had decided to carry out. Footnote, explaining the derivation of the Greek word, idein, to behold. Now, it makes no difference whether he has his pattern outside himself, that he may direct his glance to it, or within himself, conceived and placed there by himself. God has within himself these patterns of all things, and his mind comprehends the harmonies and the measures of the whole totality of things which are to be carried out. He is filled with these shapes which Plato calls the ideas, imperishable, unchangeable, not subject to decay, and therefore, though men die, humanity itself, or the idea of a man, according to which he is molded, lasts on, and though men toil and perish, it suffers no change. Accordingly, there are five causes, as Plato says, the material, the agent, the makeup, the model, and the end in view. Last comes the result of all these, just as in the case of the statue, to go back to the figure with which we began, the material is the bronze, the agent is the artist, the makeup is the form which is adapted to the material, the model is the pattern imitated by the agent, the end in view is the purpose in the maker's mind, and finally, the result of all these is the statue itself. The universe also, in Plato's opinion, possesses all these elements. The agent is God, the source, matter, the form, the shape, and the arrangement of the visible world. The pattern is, doubtless, the model according to which God has made this great and most beautiful creation. The purpose is his object in so doing. Do you ask what God's purpose is? It is goodness. Plato, at any rate, says, What was God's reason for creating the world? God is good, and no good person is grudging of anything that is good. Therefore, God made it the best world possible. Hand down your opinion then, O judge. State who seems to you to say what is truest, and not who says what is absolutely true. For to do that is far beyond our ken as truth itself. This throng of causes, defined by Aristotle and by Plato, embraces either too much or too little. Footnote. The Stoic view, besides making the four categories of substance, form, variety, and variety of relation, regarded material things as the only things which possessed being. The Stoics thus differ from Aristotle and Plato in holding that nothing is real except matter. Besides, they relate everything to one ultimate cause, the acting force, or efficient cause. End footnote. For if they regard as causes of an object that is to be made, everything without which the object cannot be made, they have named too few. Time must be included among the causes, for nothing can be made without time, they must also include place. For if there be no place where a thing can be made, it will not be made. And motion, too, 
Nothing is either made or destroyed without motion. There is no art without motion, no change of any kind. Now, however, I am searching for the first, the general cause. This must be simple, inasmuch as matter, too, is simple. Do we ask what cause is? It is surely creative reason, in other words, God. For those elements to which you referred are not a great series of independent causes. They all hinge on one alone, and that will be the creative cause. Do you maintain that form is a cause? This is only what the artist stamps upon his work. It is part of a cause, but not the cause. Neither is the pattern a cause, but an indispensable tool of the cause. His pattern is as indispensable to the artist as the chisel or the file. Without these, art can make no progress. But for all that, these things are neither parts of the art nor causes of it. Then, perhaps you will say, the purpose of the artist, that which leads him to undertake to create something, is the cause. It may be a cause. It is not, however, the efficient cause but only an accessory cause. But there are countless accessory causes. What we are discussing is the general cause. Now the statement of Plato and Aristotle is not in accord with their usual penetration when they maintain that the whole universe, the perfectly wrought work, is a cause. For there is a great difference between a work and the cause of a work. Either give your opinion or as is easier in cases of this kind, declare that the matter is not clear and call for another hearing. Footnote, i.e. restate the question and hear the evidence again. But you will reply, what pleasure do you get from wasting your time on these problems which relieve you of none of your emotions, rout none of your desires? So far as I am concerned, I treat and discuss them as matters which contribute greatly toward calming the spirit and I search myself first, and then the world about me. And not even now am I, as you think, wasting my time. For all these questions, provided that they be not chopped up and torn apart into such unprofitable refinements, elevate and enlighten the soul, which is weighted down by a heavy burden, and desires to be freed and to return to the elements of which it was once a part. For this body of ours, is a weight upon the soul and its penance. As the load presses down, the soul is crushed and is in bondage, unless philosophy has come to its assistance and has bid it take fresh courage by contemplating the universe, and has turned it from things earthly to things divine. There it has its liberty, there it can roam abroad. Footnote. According to the Stoics, the soul, which consisted of fire or breath and was a part of the divine essence, rose at death into the ether and became one with the stars. Seneca elsewhere, Consolatio ad Marciam, states that the soul went through a sort of purifying process, a view which may have had some influence on Christian thought. The souls of the good, the Stoics maintained, were destined to last until the end of the world the souls of the bad to be extinguished before that time." End footnote. Meantime, it escapes the custody in which it is bound and renews its life in heaven, just as skilled workmen, who have been engaged upon some delicate piece of work which wearies their eyes with straining, if the light which they have is niggardly or uncertain, go forth into the open air and in some park devoted to the people's recreation delight their eyes in the generous light of day, so the soul, imprisoned as it has been in this gloomy and darkened house, seeks the open sky whenever it can, and in the contemplation of the universe finds rest. The wise man, the seeker after wisdom, is bound closely indeed to his body, but he is an absentee, so far as his better self is concerned, and he concentrates his thoughts upon lofty things. Bound, so to speak, to his oath of allegiance, he regards the period of life as his term of service. He is so trained that he neither loves nor hates life. He endures a mortal lot, 
although he knows that an ampler lot is in store for him. Do you forbid me to contemplate the universe? Do you compel me to withdraw from the whole, and restrict me to a part? May I not ask what are the beginnings of all things, who molded the universe, who took the confused and conglomerate mass of sluggish matter, and separated it into its parts? May I not inquire who is the master builder of this universe, how the mighty bulk was brought under the control of law and order, who gathered together the scattered atoms, who separated the disordered elements and assigned an outward form to elements that lay in one vast shapelessness? Or whence came all the expanse of light, and whether it is fire, or something even brighter than fire? Footnote. The sequence of elements from the earth outwards and upwards was earth, water, air, and fire. The upper fire was ether. Aristotle held that ether was a different sort of fire, but the Stoics denied this. Am I not to ask these questions? Must I be ignorant of the heights whence I have descended? Whether I am to see this world but once, or to be born many times? What is my destination afterwards? What abode awaits my soul on its release from the laws of slavery among men? Do you forbid me to have a share in heaven? In other words, do you bid me live with my head bowed down? No, I am above such an existence. I was born to a greater destiny than to be a mere chattel of my body, and I regard this body as nothing but a chain which manacles my freedom. Therefore, I offer it as a sort of buffer to fortune, and shall allow no wound to penetrate through to my soul. For my body is the only part of me which can suffer injury. In this dwelling, which is exposed to peril, my soul lives free. Never shall this flesh drive me to feel fear, or to assume any pretense that is unworthy of a good man. Never shall I lie in order to honor this petty body. When it seems proper, I shall sever my connection with it, and at present, while we are bound together, our alliance shall nevertheless not be one of equality. The soul shall bring all quarrels before its own tribunal. To despise our bodies is sure freedom. To return to our subject, this freedom will be greatly helped by the contemplation of which we were just speaking. All things are made up of matter and of God. God controls matter, which encompasses him and follows him as its guide and leader. And that which creates, in other words, God, is more powerful and precious than matter, which is acted upon by God. God's place in the universe corresponds to the soul's relation to man. World matter corresponds to our mortal body. Therefore, let the lower serve the higher. Let us be brave in the face of hazards. Let us not fear wrongs, or wounds, or bonds, or poverty. And what is death? It is either the end, or a process of change. I have no fear of ceasing to exist. It is the same as not having begun. Nor do I shrink from changing into another state, because I shall, under no conditions, be as cramped as I am now. Farewell. End of chapter 65 End of Moral Letters, Volume 1 by Lucius Anias Seneca Translated by Richard M. Gummier Recording by Felipe Vogel